The Unshackled Waves, episode 22. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms here for this week's review episode. A lot has been happening around the world the past week with uh, a fake news and Russian hacking being taken to the next level. Uh, with the mainstream media, they continue to, by any means necessary, try and delegitimize Trump's presidency. But by this time next week, he will finally be president, unless there is a last minute crisis which is whipped up by the establishment. Uh, back here in Australia, it is Australia Day next week on January 26th, celebrating the settling of Australia. But of course, the left can't let an Australia Day go by without calling it racist and offensive, and their attacks on the National Day have already begun. So to discuss this week's events, I'm joined by the Unshackled's latest contributor, and who will also be our New Zealand correspondent, is Daniel Gross. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. Good to see you guys. So before we begin, I thought uh, I'd ask, uh, we in Australia, we tend to think that the left is pretty bad here, but can you give us an idea of what they're like in New Zealand? Do they have, have much influence? It's the same. I mean, the only resemblance of any type of mediocre right-wing party is ACT, and they're just as terrible as the rest of them. Um, the left, uh, I mean, you've got the Greens, which is a communist party, we got two. We we are probably the most racist country aside from South Africa and New Zealand. We have two outright racist parties in the Maori and the Maori Party and the Mana Party. We have the Labour Party, who's pretty much the same thing, um, who's just uh, you know a little bit right of the of the Communists and the Green Party. And then we have the National Party, who sort of just acts like a left wing party, but they're just sort of like the best of the worst. So everyone votes for them. And the New Zealand First, um, I, I don't know what's happening with them recently, but they, I mean, back in the last election, they were essentially just another left-wing party. So the entirety of the political system in New Zealand is majority left-wing. So the same thing that's happening in New Zealand is happening in Australia, happening in Canada, America, Europe, right, where any type of, you know, you know, two inches from the, from, you know, the center is, you know, you're now, you know, Hitler, which is another discussion. But yeah, it's just as bad in New Zealand as it is everywhere else in the world. I think wherever we are in the world, we tend to think that our country is the worst. But then we meet people from other countries and like, no, it's 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 pretty bad here. And uh, you just think to yourself, oh, it's uh, it's a Western phenomenon in in every country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, it's it's uh, it's insidious, right? The the way in which the communists work is they work generationally, right? We don't have the sort of foresight to do things like this, where they say they plan this from like the 1920s, where they go, we're going to influence, you know, go into governments and this type of stuff, and we don't have the the capacity to do that. We we don't think that far ahead, right? Um, but yeah, it's the left is insidious throughout the entire West, right? We need a full clean out, right? Yeah, uh, it's, it's certainly we're we're all in the same battle together. Yeah, it's now, yeah, it's uh, sink or swim, right? And it's not you know when the when one wins, everyone wins. When one loses, we all lose, right? If Europe falls, everyone falls, right? These people have nukes. Like if if Europe falls, we all fall. If America falls, we all fall, right? As soon as one, it's sort of like a chain, right? As soon as one goes down, like you have to, we have to help each other. It's not it's not one. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Well, it's good that there's uh, a lot of us in all the different countries uh, fighting back. Now, mm. let's get into this week's events, which mm -hmm. I alluded to in the introduction. So yep. the first topic is the the fake news about Donald Trump, where there was uh, this uh, alleged uh, uh, intelligence uh, dossier, uh, which uh, uh, which claimed because uh, because Donald Trump has, uh, you know, wants to get along with Russia and Vladimir Putin. Uh, this dossier uh, said that uh, he was a, basically a Russian agent. They had uh, compromising inf information on him and they were basically uh, black blackmailing him. So he would have, pr uh, so you would have pro-Russian uh, policies. And one of the allegations was that he paid Russian prostitutes uh, in uh, Moscow. He 
he stayed at the, the same hotel room that the Obamas did and uh, hired these prostitutes to uh, piss in the, the bed, uh, or I should use the correct term, urinate, uh, on the bed that the Obamas slept in because he hates the Obamas so much that uh, he, 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 he wanted that to happen. So this scandal has been called uh, P- uh, Pissgate, uh, Golden Gate, uh, shower gate, whatever, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so uh, this uh, intelligence report, it's completely uh, unverified, and we'll we'll go in, we'll go into the the details about it shortly. But it was uh, been circulating for a while, and uh, BuzzFeed, uh, yes, that uh, that uh, highbrow uh, media organisation decided they were they they would publish it. They, and, we, and the article basically said, oh. Well, we don't know if it's true or not, but we're just going to publish it and uh, let you make up your own mind. Like, and it had all these disclaimers in it. And of course, there's been nothing else to to back to back these claims up. Um, so, so uh, it's a, it's another another example of you know, the the mainstream media themselves being fake news. Uh, they they came from uh, uh, a British MI6. Uh, intelligence officer who was who uh, Christopher Steele, who was hired by a Republican donor uh, to, uh, b- uh, by this uh, research firm to compile this dirt on Trump. This uh, Republican donor was aligned with um, Jeb Bush, and so this is where this dossier came from. It was uh, it was eventually dropped by um, by the Republican backer uh, because Trump was likely to secure the nomination. Then it was picked up by a uh, pro-Democrat uh, donor. And so this uh, dossier had been circulating for a while. Uh, yeah. it, it was completely unverified. And it also, if, though it had, had uh, gained a following online and uh, uh, was talked about quite a bit on uh, 4chan, which is the anonymous mes- messaging board. So there, there was some reporting that this whole thing was made up by users of, of 4chan, which which yeah. I thought was a bit absurd. I don't think the CIA and FBI would be... Well, well they're, pre- they're pretty bad organisations, but I don't think they would be that stupid enough to fall for a, for, a 4chan prank. But, yeah, it was a... a it, it was an actual report required by uh, an ex-intelligent person, but yeah, there was nothing to back up the claims. Yeah, and the um, the big thing for me was the fact that Buzzfeed published it, but it's that every other news organization knew about it. Uh, they talked about it for months. I mean, in September, October, all these media organizations were alluding to it, and they said, you know, there's this massive dirt on Trump, there's massive dirt, you know, there's all the sexual stuff on Trump. And then none of it came out because none of this could be verified. And I think a few people figured it out that it, the whole thing was nonsense. But, um, you know, the mainstream media being the mainstream media, they do, now they've just released it. Um, but this is, this is really, really terrible. I mean, this is just the, the end of the mainstream media's credibility. I mean, this is sort of like the watershed moment. It's sort of had been trickling down and down and down. But I think the, the piss gate is really the the end of the line of the mainstream media's credibility. Yeah, I mean, the, the way they've been behaving pretty much since uh, Trump began his, uh, his presidential run, I mean, uh, over, and I think the main, uh, main uh, the peak of this for me was when they reported on all those uh, fake hate crimes that happened after Trump Trump won the election, and of course there was we saw in the WikiLeaks emails all the collusion between Hillary's campaign and the the, the mainstream media. So yeah, they they certainly haven't got much credibility left after this election. And um, and the main thing for me is not the the actual piscate itself, right? The actual report and stuff. I mean that's all nonsense, and that's fine. Uh, but the real thing is is that the we now have an incoming president where the method in which we hold presidents to account, which is the media, have no credibility. And so now we have a politically, we now have a politician who's been um, elected, where the only method we have to, you know, to sort of chain in the, his power, has we have no method of, uh, the media has no credibility left to, um, to bring, to, to hold him to account. So, so eventually a president is going to do something that we disagree with, something that we think is wrong. And if Trump does something like that, 
there's only a handful of organizations and people that actually have any credibility to criticize them. And this is extremely dangerous for anyone who uh, who thinks that, you know, a unrestricted government power can be, you know, somewhat dangerous, right? Anyone who's, you know, somewhat, you know, millimeter, you know, from the center to the right, we know that government power is, is a very dangerous thing. And now, you know, there's only a handful of organizations, right? It's like Breitbart, Infowars, Drudge, you know, Stefan Molyneux, Cernovich, you know, there's only a Paul Joseph Watson, there's only a handful of people that were truly objective in their coverage of Trump. And those are the only people that can legitimately criticize them with any type of credibility. And we're now entering an age where the media have no credibility to hold a, uh, a one of the most, well, the most powerful person in the world to account. And this is, this can go really, this can either go really bad or really, uh, really well or really bad. And this is, this is a very dangerous time. And the only thing that I can think of is that that power is just going to go from the mainstream media to the alternative media, right? I think Pissgate is the end of the mainstream media, and it's going to be the rise of the alternative media because no one has, the media has no credibility left. And the only people that have credibility now are the people, you know, the alternative media that were reporting on it. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that the mainstream media is dying. Like, I don't think a, a handful of corporations should be the gatekeepers of what the public uh, ca uh, ca uh, can and uh, can't know. And I believe, like, even though there is much more disinformation like out there because of the internet, like, I do still, still, still think that the truth will come out eventually. I mean, uh, people are savvy enough to work out in the end, you know, what's real and, and what's fake. So... Uh, yeah, I, I don't agree that you know uh, that now like any any attack on Trump will have will have no credibility. I mean, uh, there was you know the the Access Hollywood tape like that st that that still came out. Yet the American people decided in the end they 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 still didn't care. So yeah, I I, I still think that you know tr uh, Trump will will be held to account, especially by his supporters if he doesn't deliver. Yeah, well, the only people that can, like the only people that have any credibility to hold him to an, to account are his supporters, because the people that attacked him, the people, because it's it's fine to be in a in a political discussion and to say you know I disagree with Trump on this this policy this policy this policy right I don't agree with the wall I don't agree with this I don't agree with the taxes I don't agree with it right you can have a debate but that's not what they did they went and falsified all sorts of information about Trump I mean anyone that had watched the media for the last eighteen months. I mean, you could turn on, and every every single thing they put was a lie. Every every time he'd make a statement, they'd twist it out of context. You know, all I mean, the the list of the of the untruths about Donald Trump are like you could make out. You know, you could spend hours and hours and hours going through them. And I mean, look what happened in the last few month, few weeks of the um, of the campaign. Right, he had all these women come out and say he raped them. Right, and all all the sexual allegations. None of it was true, and everyone reported on it as if it were. And I mean, that, that for me was one of the ends of sort of the credibility for them. But this Pissgate thing is way beyond anything that I would have thought would happen to the media. But the, it's a good thing in the fact that the, the mainstream media will lose all credibility because they're the sort of traitor media. But it means that the, for, um, for at least a, a small period of time, you'll have very little um, sort of pushback from the media. Um, to, to political power, which can be very dangerous. But um, it will just mean that the media's power will go from the mainstream to the alternative media, which can only be a good thing. Yeah. But, I mean, I mean uh, mainstream media, they used to have the power to yeah, tear down a president if they wanted to. I mean, uh, it was it was pretty much the, the mainstream media who tore down uh, Nixon. I mean, Watergate was pretty minor scandal compared to what other presidents have done, yet because the media didn't like him, they were basically able to, to hound him out of office. Yet, uh, I definitely think that if like we still if we were still living in a traditional media world, uh, you know, Trump wouldn't have been able to become president because mainstream media just would have been the gatekeepers of everything. Yeah, absolutely. And you, th and you think about what he does with Twitter, right? The reason they hate tw him using Twitter so much is because he now no longer needs them. He only uses them for whatever he needs them for, and that's it. Everything else, I mean, he no longer needs the media, and the media need him, which is a it's an un unbalanced relationship, which is um, interesting to watch, that's for sure. Now, I want to talk briefly about uh, BuzzFeed, because I think, like, 
uh, to, uh, to, when we talk about new media, uh, this like BuzzFeed is the worst example uh, of the of the new media. For those who don't know BuzzFeed, they're a left wing clickbait uh, website. Where ba basically, what they've done to political discourse: if a politician or public figure says anything that's not politically correct, uh, then you know BuzzFeed say how awful this is. They must apologise. They must resign. You know, like. It's basically turning politicians into into boring zombies, and then they also release all these social justice videos where it's like, you know, black people have questions for white people, gay questions have people treat people, women have questions for men, and they basically all these questions are, you know, why are you such bigots? Like that's what all the questions are. So they really are a destructive destructive force and they really are quite arrogant as well which i think is why they published this they thought that pretty much you know we you know we're so powerful that you know we, uh, we can you know publish this and get away with it which is which is what gorka thought which was a, a tabloid uh, news website and uh, they went bankrupt uh, because Hulk Hogan sued them over a, a sex tape, and they uh, Hulk, Hulk Hogan had 140 million dollars worth of damages uh, uh, given to him, which bankrupted Gorka. Uh, so you know, Buzzfeed, they're <laughs> we're sort of hoping this is the beginning of the end for them as well. Yeah, and I mean, it's not. Buzzfeed, whether they get sued or not, I think they probably will. I think Trump will probably sue them. But whether they get sued or not, I mean, it's the end of their their credibility as a as a publishing house. But I think the best thing about the um, the new sort of age we're going in with media is that the internet never forgets, right? The internet has everything on record. Everything is archived. You can never undo a public. You, know, you can never undo what you you've what you've done in the past, right? People can always go back and say, you know. You know, if you you know um, on you know 4chan and Reddit, there's all these pictures of you know CNN, you know four years ago and CNN now. You know, you know Huffington Post four years ago and you know Huffington Post now, or you know just a few months apart. And you know the internet doesn't forget what they say, and that is going to um, do one of two things. It's either going to raise the credibility of the media, or it's going to completely destroy all um, all sort of faith in the media, and then the people are going to have to become the media. That's all it is, is that the media, the problem is that the media is just that they don't, they've just torched their entire credibility. And now the only people with credibility are the sort of the, the people, right? And everything now is going to have to be sourced. Everything now is going to have to be triple checked. Um, and it's going to have to be the people that do it because we can't trust these, these companies to do it, right? Because they just, they don't have it. And so, yeah, what we're doing is sort of the new media, right? Yeah. I, I mean, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't really call like BuzzFeed like new media technically because, you know, they, they were pretty much uh, bankrolled by, you know, a few, a few wealthy uh, online entrepreneurs. So, yeah, they are definitely uh, not alternative. But, yeah, it was, uh, I also want to turn to Trump's uh, press, press conference in response mm -hmm. to these allegations where uh, he wouldn't take a question from CNN saying, your organization's terrible, you're fake news. And I, I couldn't believe that people said because he criticized CNN that he was threatening freedom of the press. Mm -hmm. so it's like, no, he's allowed to, you know, criticize a news organization. That's not taking away their freedom at all. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean that, that was just ridiculous. I mean, like CNN was the the main of uh, main TV network that regurgitated all of this stuff. So yeah, he's quite right to you know criticize them. Yeah, and the the question is who is the real news and who's the fake news, right? And my sort of um, sort of litmus test is anyone that was involved in the WikiLeaks is now officially fake news because they're no longer news. They now become operatives of the Democratic Party. They're now political cheerleaders. All organizations that were involved in the WikiLeaks, involved in John Podesta running them, and they have like these big meetings that like, they all of them come. It's like, are you kidding me? No, you're, you, you're now cheerleaders, or officially cheerleaders of the left. You're officially Democratic Party cheerleaders. And although you can, you know, you can say things that are real, but you no longer get the credibility of being a news organization. You're now just a, you know, a partisan organization. All right. The only news organizations that have any credibility are the ones that are, are you know, reported um, accurately or sort of even just remotely fairly with Trump, which was almost none of them. 
Like all the all the major left wing news organizations, um, I, I would consider all of them to be fake news in one, one sort of respect or another. Yeah, and, and I mean, uh, I think the most absurd thing was that uh, BuzzFeed, uh, uh, Trump called them a failing pile of garbage, which was hilarious. <laughs> they, 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 de they, they decided to cash in on uh, this, uh, this quote by selling a whole bunch of rem memorabilia with it on, and they were donating it to some... Uh, left-wing front organization, the uh, uh, organization to protect journalists, which was, uh, uh, like I said, I mean, uh, you know, the, these bo bogus left-wing groups to, oh, you know, we've got to protect freedom of the press. They're, uh, they're just, they're just basically a, a tan uh, them throwing a tan tantrum because they're losing their influence and uh, no one's taking them seriously anymore. Yeah, and it's all projection, right? It's the they're saying that you know. The, they are the fake news, right? Everything that they do is fake, right? They, everything they say is a projection of, of reality. Everything they accuse Trump of, I think they're doing themselves, right? Everything that, you know, um, when they say that, you know, they're destroying freedom of the press, right? That's what Obama, like you talk about freedom of the press, Obama has, you know, um, persecuted more journalists than anyone, than I think it's all the other presidents combined or something ridiculous, right? Um, the the amount of whistleblowers that Obama's gone after, I mean, you talk about freedom of the press being you know under under threat. I mean, the the executive orders and the stuff that Obama signed in is, I mean, you talk about chalk and cheese, right? Trump is nowhere near what Obama's done to the press. I mean, the Associated Press were scared to to report certain things. I mean, this came out a couple of years ago because of about what Obama, well, they were afraid of the Obama presidency, right? Even the Associated Press knew about this. Yeah, well, that segues nicely into our second topic, which is discussing Obama's legacy as president. Uh, Trump becoming mm -hmm. president means that Obama is no longer president, which is a, which is a good thing. So we'll, just, <laughs> we'll, we'll start uh, with the economy, and um, mm. you know we've heard, we've heard, for example, the debt and deficit. They've been talked about quite a bit for the past eight years, yet they they still keep ticking up. I mean, the debt is now nearly uh, twenty uh, trillion dollars. Mm. And, yeah, and we uh, we also have to remember that um, there was the the failed stimulus. Uh, there was these various uh, green uh, green schemes which which didn't work. And of course, uh, a big part of his uh, spending was, of course, uh, uh, Obamacare, uh, which cost a lot of money as well. So, uh, how would you rate Obama on the economy? Well, uh, Obama in general with the economy, I mean, if you get a trillion dollars a year uh, as a, as debt, I mean, the economy is going to look good, right? The problem is what happens afterwards, right? If we go, if I give you, if you're running a household, right, and you get $10,000, you know, a year of free money with a credit card, after eight years and you have $80,000 of debt, right, you're not doing better, you just have to pay back the debt eventually. Right. It's not that the, the economy is exponentially worse now than when Obama took office. Right. It's got I think it's 21 trillion now of debt, but it's not just uh, 21 trillion of debt. There's hundreds of trillions in unfunded liabilities. Right. I mean, if any company re reported the way the government does, you go to jail. Right. The real debt is you know, hundreds of trillions of dollars and unfunded liabilities. Right. The deficits and you know, the stimulus was just taking money from one group to the other. Right. Um, but the the economy, I mean, the uh, unemployment rate is around 20, 20 something percent, right? There's 96 million people who can't get a job, who can't find a job in, in, uh, in America now, right? 96 million, right? 50 something million are on food stamps. I mean, to say that Obama economy is anywhere near anything other than an absolute disaster is, uh, would just be, you know, factually wrong. I mean, right? just objectively. Yeah. I mean the the economy like yes like uh, like Obama, Obama supporters are correct when they say the economy goes growing but only just I mean and as you said the medium household income's gone gone down the uh, there's more people living below the 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 poverty line I mean uh, you know the the American people are not. Um, you know, better off than they than they were eight years ago. I mean, and that's one of the reasons that they they voted for Trump because he was you know wanting to bring back jobs and industry to uh, you know to America. So 
you know, this, uh, this idea that there was, you know, some economic, you know, recovery under, under Obama is, is just fanciful. Well, there, there was one part of the economy that did a really good, that did really well, right, which was the finance industry, the, the share market, right, the stock market did really well, the government sector did really well, right, all the companies that are involved with the government and have government contracts, they did amazing, right, and going to, into the uh, going into the Obamacare thing, right? All the all the um, health insurance companies they did unbelievably well, right? All the major ones, right? They the, Obamacare was just a consolidation of just healthcare industries, right? All the all the donors and all the special interest groups did unbelievably well, right? But they did that at the expense of the country, right? At the expense of the ordinary average person. You know, you know, contrary to what Obama ran on, which was hope and change, and you know, or you know, working for the for the for the little guy, right? He did the absolute opposite, and it was just scandal after scandal was was Obamacare's uh, Obama's legacy. Yeah, we might go into Obamacare in a bit more detail. Which uh, for uh, for those of you who, um, well, it was. Uh, his supporters sold it as universal health care, which it, which it wasn't. It was it was basically a mandate that forced every uh, citizen to to buy uh, private private health insurance. And because uh, the government mandated that all these things be covered, uh, premiums skyrocketed. So it became vastly unaffordable for a lot of people. So you know, it's actually it's actually you know hurt hurt a lot of people whose health care beforehand was actually quite good. Yeah, yeah. As Zane Coulter puts it, there, the unaffordable care act, right? Mm. It's uh, it, the everything. The, every time the government ma labels a bill, you just it's the opposite, right? Uh, it's the it was the most un unaffordable thing that the government has ever done, or the American government has ever done. Right? They took over one sixth or one seventh of the economy, and it's just been an absolute disaster. And as as Trump said, you know, earlier, he said, "I could have let this thing go." And it would have just wreaked havoc on the country, but I would have had held power forever, right? Because of how bad it would how bad it would have been for the Democrats. And that's, I mean, credit to Trump; he, they've already repealed it. But the disaster that was Obamacare is uh, was horrific. But luckily, they've repealed it, and hopefully, they're going to repeal it and replace it very soon. I think that's still going through the Senate now. But um, yeah, Obamacare was a big disaster. But, yeah. So we might move on to um, Obama's uh, so, uh, social policy, and obviously, uh, sort of the the, uh, the big uh, thing that he that he pushed as president was the the LGBT agenda. I mean, uh, under him, or was it the yeah the Supreme Court uh, legalized um, same sex marriage, uh, and there was also uh, this this year the whole push with um, tra uh, trans transgender rights, which sort of um, you know uh, like a lot a lot of people like you know uh, like I think most people think that you know uh, LGBT people uh, you know they they deserve you know um, you know uh, rights, but sort of under Obama it it probably went a, a bit too far. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, the social policies, the uh, the the rise of political correctness and the social ju justice warrior stuff and the and the and the and the racism stuff. I mean, America. I mean, let's be real. Obama was an uh, was an affirmative action candidate. I mean, he he ran on no record, right? He was a senator for like two years, and no one knew who he was. He was a community organizer out of Chicago, right? He was a Chicago mobster. Um, he was an affirmative action candidate. And he ran, I mean, that was the reason he won, right? Or one of the reasons he won. I mean, blacks voted for him in like 99% or something. Um, so the thought that race relations would get better under an affirmative action system is ludicrous, right? Whenever you force uh, groups together, right, you get the opposite of cohesion, right? Whenever something is done by force, you get you people always sort of retract um, just naturally, and that's sort of what Obama's done. And so the only way they can get the way in which the left gets power is a system called balkanization, where they take one they take a minority and they give them extra special rights to the majority. It's a method developed by a guy called Zbigniew Brzezinski, and um, and 
he did it with the Balkans, right? So he wrote many books on this. And the way what they're doing is they've given, you know, what they with, the, with these extra rights that they're giving to you know, LGBTs and uh, blacks and all and the and the uh, illegals, right? In America, in America, right? And in New Zealand, we do it with the Maoris. It's, uh, in Australia, I think they do it with the Aboriginals and the Torres Strait Islanders. It's all the same method, just in a different country, um, where they give the minorities extra rights. And what happens is the minorities then defend the rights against the majority because it comes at the expense of the majority. And then the government plays the minority against the majority. And because you get both of those to fight, you ignore the government stealing all the money, right? And that's what's happening. That's what the race war is, right? That's, this is what the, the left have you know, begged for and worked towards for almost 100 years is a massive race war because that, that's how they win, right? They win by dividing the country into specific little groups that they can then control and then play a referee between the fighting and then they can sit on top and then just control all the groups and then whenever one group gets too strong they take right you know and then whenever one you know doesn't get strong enough and they sort of play all the groups against, uh, against each other and then they stay in power right that's a method that they stay in power and um it's a uh, it's a shame that not many people understand that but um, yeah, that's that's the whole reason for it. It's not because they care about black people or they care about the LGBT community or they care about political correctness or any of this type of stuff. It's a method of social control that the government uses or the left uses as a way of putting the country against each other so they can so they can get further control, right? So they can get more taxes, they can get more regulations passed. And you know, further destroy industry because that's how they get power, right? It's all about power for for the left, and that's that's the main thing. Uh, at least I can I believe for for the social policies, was to split the to balkanize the country apart. Um, you know, the the that's sort of been the goal for a hundred for about a hundred years. Yeah, I, I, and a lot of this, like, uh, social policy, it wasn't, like, he didn't actually have a policy that's saying, you know, I'm going to pass a law saying you have to be politically correct. Um, you know, it, w it was basically, you know, he, his rhetoric, you know, his sort of worldview that ha that sort of, it, it caught, it, it, certain groups felt empowered because, you know, Obama sympathised, you know, with, with their leftist progressive agenda. I mean, that's why you saw the social justice warriors take over university camp campuses and why you saw, you know, Black Lives Matter feel empowered to, you know, uh, bur uh, burn down cities is because, you know, they fe felt that, you know, we have a president who's sympathetic to, you know, what we believe. And, mm. so, and so, you know, that's, I, I think that's why, you know, there, there was sort of this, uh, this movement in American society where, you know, people were getting fired because, you know, they didn't hold politically correct uh, views. You know, there were all these boycotts of uh, businesses who didn't have politically correct opinions. So sort of, yeah, even, even though, like, like, like I said, he didn't have, you know, a certain policy, it was certainly, I think it just shows the power that the president has, that he can sort of have this chilling effect in society. Yeah. It's the rise of the thought police, right? It's the scariest thing you could think of, because the, the the real tyranny is not enforced from the government. The real tyranny is enforced socially, right? It's enforced laterally, where the people sort of police each other, right? That's the ultimate goal of of tyrannical governments. That's what you know. If you look at what the Nazis wrote, the with the like this is just um, a little bit of history, right? And with the Gestapo. I think it was like 90 something percent of all the investigations that the Gestapo did came from the public, right? Tyranny is never enforced top down because it takes too much resources. The, mo the most efficient way to, to police a, a group, right, with political correctness, or whatever, was to do it socially. And that's the scariest thing about what Trump, well, sorry, what uh, Obama's done is he sort of enabled this and got people to enforce these crazy politically correct rules, which is basically the thought police, socially, which is more constricted than the government doing it. Because at least when the government does it, you can go, oh, well, if the cops aren't around, then I can say whatever I want. But if it's enforced socially, it's a much more restrictive. And that's, I think, a, a much worse, right, than, than the government doing it. Now, let's talk about... Um 
uh, Obama's foreign policy. Now, remember, he was elected as the, the peace candidate. Yeah, he the was hope going, and change for peace. He, yeah. he was going to <laughs> uh, end, end all of the wars, but it turned out he killed more people than uh, more foreigners than George W. Bush. Uh, he started more wars. Let, let's not forget the overthrow of Gaddafi in Libya. Uh, that, that was pretty much a, a US war. I mean, they ena enabled uh, Gaddafi to be overthrown. They assisted the uh, so-called moderate rebels in, in Syria and have led to a civil war in that country for, for now f five years. And also they've got, um, uh, they, uh, they've got Saudi Arabia fighting, uh, fighting a war, a proxy war against Iran in, in Yemen. So uh, Middle East is, you know, it's, it's still, still on fire after, after, after all these years. And Obama has probably been more interventionist than what George W. Bush was. Yeah, much more. And the thing with um, Obama's foreign policy it's not just the Middle East, but also with Mexico, is I think this is the first time, maybe George Bush, if you talk about 9-11, but I think this is the first time a president has ever committed outright treason and no one, no one questioned it, right? It's a very strange thing because treason is working against the interests of the country or supporting your enemies. Now, with just with quickly with Libya, with Benghazi, Benghazi was a was the the report came out four years after, right, of it happened. The big eight hundred page report is out, and the stuff that Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Schaefer talked about as it happened was all proven to be correct. Which was uh, Benghazi was a stand down operation from the State Department to transfer weapons from the CIA to Al Qaeda, then Al Qaeda from 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 Libya to Syria. Right. And so what happened was the government, the U.S. government refused to help the um, the people in Benghazi in the compound. And they stood down for 13 hours. Right. That's what the movie is called, 13 hours, because they wanted the jihadis to get the weapons from the CIA to transfer them to Libya. And that is, by all definitions, treason. Right. Which is you sacrifice your own people at the, to help your enemies. And you're, you're now funding and, you know, uh, or uh, arming your enemies at the expense of your own people. That is the first time treason has ever been, has ever happened, and no one says a word about it, right? And, not, and it's not just the first time. There are, um, people forget um, Operation Fast and Furious, where the Justice Department and the FBI and the um, uh, uh, ATF gave weapons Right, and armed the Mexican cartels in Mexico in the hope that they would bring the weapons back into America and commit crime so they could demonize the Second Amendment to pass gun control legislation. Right? That is, by any definition, treason, where you're funding armed mil militias in foreign countries to come into your country and to kill your citizens, essentially, with weapons in order to remove the rights of your citizens. Right. These are just two examples of outright treason. Right. Because there's no other way to describe it where this has happened and no one seemed to like bat an eye or no one wants to use the word, which is blatantly what it, what it is. Right. Which is uh, actively working against the interests of your country at the expense of the citizens of your country to support the enemies of your country. Right. That's I mean, you can't get a more concrete sort of definition of treason. And every and those two at least, right? There's many. I think there's a couple more, but at least those two major ones, which is on record, and you can go read the congressional testimony, right? There's not no one even debates this, right? And I think the real Obama legacy, at least as foreign policy, is it's the first time a, a Western government or Western sort of power has committed outright treason against the citizens, and no one seems to care, or no one seems to bat an eye about it. And that's to me was the the most shocking thing about. His foreign policy. What do you think? Yeah. Oh well, I think the reason that he got away with so much is because there is a different standard for uh, Republican presidents and Democratic <laughs> presidents. I mean, uh, Obama's uh, actions overseas. I mean, it demonstrated the complete hypocrisy of the anti-war left. I mean, you know, they were marching in the streets against uh, George W. Bush. You know, when he invaded Iraq, but you know, when Obama, uh, you know, invaded. Uh, 
or invaded, should I say invaded Libya? Well, pretty, uh, pretty much there was, oh, they just carpet bombed it. Really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they, they were egging him on saying, you know, yes, liberate yeah. the Libyan people. And then I, you know, all of this year they have, uh, I saw, you know, heaps of, you know, left wing people and progressives saying we must intervene in Syria. The U S must send troops over there. And it's like, you've just gone completely the other direction. Now you're, you're basically following the near, near conservative line, you know, begging for intervention. Like, do you not realize, you know, you've become interventionist now? And, and Russia, I mean, I've never seen the left want to war with Russia so much. I mean, what the hell? It's like all these people that pretend to be anti-war, I mean, they're not, right? They're anti-war. The reason that they were anti-war is they're just anti-right wing, right? They're, yeah. They were anti, anti-George anti Bush. They're not anti-war because if they were anti-war, they would be like, well, Obama has invaded all these countries. We can't support Obama. Right, they're not anti-war at all. They're they're, they're pro-government power, and if they think that being pro-war is pro-government power, then that's what they'll support. Right? It's uh, the left are just sycophants to power, and they'll do whatever is required to to get and maintain power. Right? That's all it is. But the the um, I remember on the the day after the election, I was uh, going through uh, one of the uh, one of the image boards, and my favorite meme was. Uh, I'd like to welcome the anti-war left back to the anti anti-war movement, right? And because they just disappeared for eight years, because uh, who knows why, right? The, but yeah, it's uh, well, the anti-war left really sort of shot themselves in the foot because now no no one believes them anymore, right? This is the other thing with Trump is everyone now everyone can it's not people can't people can see this stuff, right? It, because of the internet, we're not blind to these type of things anymore. And now when the left are going to have all these anti-war marches, we're going to, we can now just say, well, where were you, you know, 60 years ago in 2011 when they wanted to bomb the hell out of, you know, Libya and bomb the shit out of Syria, right? It's like, where were you guys? You know, uh, you guys weren't there. You, you guys no, no longer get credibility in criticizing anything that Trump does in foreign policy, right? That's what I, what I re referenced earlier, right? It's not just the media, but the entire political left no longer has credibility. I, I will uh, uh, just finish off by pointing out one good thing that Obama has done is that he's shattered a lot of people's hope in progressivism and big government. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I mean, it's you know, he, like like we said, he was elected in you know hope and change. This was going to be you know government, uh, you know, uh, creating a better society for for the citizens. Yet it just hasn't has uh, yeah. Obviously, it hasn't turned out that way, which it, it never does. So uh, there <laughs> there, is, there is a lesson to be learnt. Uh, we hope. Yeah, communism gets tried every generation, and it kills a whole bunch of people every generation, then fails, and then we never learn, right? But yeah, hopefully we learn quick fast enough for it not to go full sort of communism before we turn it around this time. So we might move uh, back uh, back to uh, uh, Oceania now for our final topic, which is yep. the Australia Day uh, controversy, which, which happens every year. I mean, Australia Day uh, is celebrated on January 26th. Uh, because uh, that uh, that was the day in 1788 when Governor Arthur Phillip landed uh, in Sydney with the the first fleet. Uh, so that is uh, so that represents sort of or the the founding of of modern Australia. And it's uh, every year it's always called Invasion Day by the left because apparently that's when the British you know invaded uh, the Aboriginals land and uh, stole it all from them and killed them all. And so uh, mm. it's 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 very offensive to uh, Ab Aboriginal people. And so. The, the date should be changed so it can be it can be more inclusive which which I've always found this invasion day rubbish to be ridiculous so you're basically the modern Australia that you know uh, or at least that that I and you know uh, everyone else lives in today like should never should never have happened you're basically saying that modern Australia shouldn't exist because mm. uh, it, it was based on as, as you call it invasion and no, it's how is it hurtful to Aboriginal people today? I mean, I would still argue that you know, uh, obviously there were some injustices uh, done throughout history. Like I don't deny that, but a lot's been done in recent times to to rectify those. And I would say that uh, Indigenous people are definitely a lot better off uh, today uh, than they would have been had you know British settlement not uh, not turned turned up at all. So that's why I don't uh, subscribe to this 
invasion day invasion day rubbish well i mean for me the it's just um it's not i think this is a microcosm of a whole sort of political ideology of the left which is the left cannot cannot bring a country down if the people are patriotic right you can't invade you can't destroy a culture in which the people are proud of being their culture right you can't you can't tear down um uh, a society when the society is proud of being who they are right you actually need to make people hate their themselves or the, their culture or the society before you can um destroy it the way they want to right and they actually they talk about this in many many publications and i think the the demonization of australia day i mean there's a reason they picked it and there's a reason they use the terms that they use right invasion day is not like a um you know they didn't just come up with this randomly right this i mean it's an inversion of reality right which is australia is bad right and the only way they can take down australia is if people no longer believe that Australia is a good thing, right? If they people need to, they need to make people believe Australia is bad in order for them to take down Australia. Because if people believe that Australia is bad, then they won't fight to defend it, right? This is sort of like a mind trick to to get people to lay down their their weapons of being patriotic, right? Being patriotic and you know caring about your country is the is the biggest weapon you have. The, the sort of the the right wing or the the patriots have against the left right is the the being proud of your country is the is the mo most important thing to defend your country against sort of any sort of negative invasion right and that's sort of why all the other stuff is is happening as well right all the pro muslim stuff and all the integration and all cuz they you need to to brainwash the culture to say that the culture is bad in order for the cult for the people to accept the destruction of their culture and if you don't have that then the people won't accept it and you won't be able to get your stuff through right the left won't cannot succeed if the people love the country right that's why in europe and america all the left does is you know crap on their own country is because they need to do that in order to get the power that they want from that from the culture no longer um, being patriotic, right? I think that is one of the massive bulwarks against the sort of the leftist uh, um, ideas is, um, and sort of everything else sort of is the, is the connector to that idea. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, uh, but, uh, the left and the elites, they push this every year, but th yeah, but the Australian people, uh, thankfully, like, they they will have, you know, none of this. Australians are, you know, very patriotic and enthusiastically um, ce uh, celebrate a, a S Australia Day every year. I mean, everyone, you know, has their, has an Australia Day barbecue with the, with the Australian flag. So uh, this idea to, to change the date, and there's always a, a debate about the, the Republic every Australia Day as well. This, like, even though it's, you know, talked about, uh, the, uh, the Australian people have just no appetite for it. So, uh, you know, it's still a shame that we have to tolerate, you know, this invasion day, change the date, uh, Australia become a Republic uh, stuff every year. But the, the Australian people themselves, you know, they, you know, they they like this day and they and they just ignore it. But I've I've noticed, yeah, I've definitely noticed that although change the date hasn't 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 really catched on. They they are trying to make it politically correct as possible. Australia Day, which is uh, we saw the the meat ads. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the uh, the meat industry has an Australia Day ad every year with Sam uh, Sam Kekovich with this patriotic message. This year they've gone full politically correct. They have uh, some Aborigines having a barbecue on the beach, and then all. All these ships uh, from pe uh, with people from different nations uh, come and uh, 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 come ashore and uh, join the and join the barbecue. And then uh, at the end, there's an asylum seeker vote that comes. And then they say, "Aren't we all boat people?" And then there's apparently uh, like a gay float there as well. And I mean, that's like <laughs> it's com it's completely ridiculous. And so. Uh, uh, we're, we're still, you know, we're having, we're still having Australia Day, like even, you know, what, what has become an icon of Australia Day still being, you know, tor torn apart and made politically correct. Yeah, and I think what the people are learning now 
at least in the last sort of four years, is there's no appeasing the left, right? There is no, there's no, if you change the date, right? Let's let's go with the, the what they want, right? If you change that to invasion day and change the date, they would just get more and more and more insistent, right? They they get more and more they get more and more crazed because as soon as they, as soon as you give them a an opening and a wedge, they'll just take a crowbar and they'll wrench it as far as it can go until you cry uncle, right? They'll go until you know until you 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 just tap out, and the moment, and I think people have, have now begun to realize this, that the moment you appease the left, it's when they get they become rabid, right? If you ever, you know, if you watch these these um, these videos online with with Milo, right? Um, Milo Yiannopoulos, who's a Breitbart editor going around America. As soon as you stand up to them, they sort of just wander off, right? But as soon as they get an idea that they might get something out of it, right? They might there's any sort of um, you know juice in the lemon to squeeze. They will they will squeeze until there's nothing else. They will squeeze until the hand bleeds, right? And I think people are now really beginning to realize that there's no compromising with these people. That is really you know be you know kill or be killed politically with the left. And I think that's what happened with Trump. And I think you're seeing it in Europe and you're seeing it in Australia with the um, with the rise of Pauline Hanson. You're seeing it. I think New Zealand first is going to be huge in the next election. I think. Um, it's huge in, in Europe. I think that's what Brexit was. I think it's the people realizing that it's sort of um, the change from Chamberlain to Churchill, right? In World War II, um, the British elected Neville Chamberlain to appease Hitler. And then once everyone realized that you couldn't appease him, they elected Churchill to go and really give him the hammer, right? And I think that's sort of what's happening in the cultures. We're figuring out that you can't really argue with them, right? You can't appease them. There's nothing that you can do to make them happy. The, and there's and it's now you know a fight or you know a kill or be killed politi politically with these people and that's sort of where we're going I think as as um, as as the culture moves on. What do you think? Yeah, I mean it, it, it is actually really quite easy to uh, to stand up to them. Like like I said, mm. the the vast majority of Australians you know love Australia and are patriotic, and so you know if you know the creators of this. Uh, you know, Lamed or, or or other you know corporations and governments just said, you know, no, we're not going to have this politically correct rubbish. You know, we're we're going to you know have a you know proud Australian Australia Day. Like every everyone would be would be supportive of that. And yes, the the left would you know kick and scream, but you know they who cares? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, and like we did see uh, an example of uh, of the left, you know, def definitely uh, going going too far with uh, the uh, Australia Day billboard they put up in Cranbourne, Melbourne, which had two uh, Muslim women wearing hijabs uh, to celebrate Australia Day, which uh, which. But it actually got so many complaints that uh, it got taken down, or as as the it was it was put up there by the Victorian state government, which is a left wing social, socialist government. So they took it down because of uh, threats, and so mm -hmm. now the the left are really upset because of you know the it, it shows you know um, uh, Muslim women integrating well. You know, I, I I look at that image and I say that no, that's not not the Australia that. Uh, it's not so integrating, right? Integrating is you know, if you want to come to Australia, if you're Muslim, you're no longer Muslim, right? Islam has no place in Western civilization. It has no place in Western culture, right? If you're a Muslim and you come to a Western country, it's because you don't want to be a Muslim, right? If you come, if you want to come to a Western country and be a Muslim, go be a Muslim in a Muslim country, right? Be with you know other Muslims, right? We don't we don't need or we don't want Islam, or at least I don't. Right? I don't know about other people. Um, in in the West, right? We don't need it. We don't want it. And the only thing it's only going to turn bad, right? And they know it, right? The government knows it, and they're bringing people in that they know they're going to cause problems, right? This is why they're bringing them in, and this is what the propaganda is: is that they've brought in so many recently. Same in New Zealand, same in Australia. They've brought in so many that now they need proper. The people need to be propagandized. That you know, to, to again to lay down your weapons because you know these people are just like you, right? And then you know it's it's not not true, right? And I think where the culture you can see the the degree to which the propaganda is going forward is the degree to which how scared they are that the that they're realizing that the people are figuring the game out, right? Once they that's why the propaganda is and it's only going to get worse, right? 
the it's going to get worse and worse before it gets better because as people figure all this stuff out, they're going to need to go much further in order to to convince the public, and it's, the public is going to have to split right between between these types of things. And I think you're going to see much much more insistent advertising on on how good Muslims are and political correctness from the government. And you're going to get a much bigger backlash from the other side as well. So I think we're going to go into interesting times in the future. Yeah. Uh, well, hopefully they won't tr try and put a. Well, there there is a, a campaign to put the billboard back up. So uh, where we'll, <laughs> and they and they've raised over a hundred thousand dollars to get the the billboard back up. So crazy. Who, who knows? We we might see it back, but. Uh, you know, it was good that you know the the reaction from ordinary people was uh, uh, to this billboard was this is too far. You know, enough with this. You know, multiculturalism, uh, Islam, Islam push. Uh, but you know, even even though the left are still up to uh, up to their usual tricks in the lead up to Australia Day, I'm sure most Australians will will f enjoy their Australia Day again and. You know, be 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 really proud of their country. So I will certainly be celebrating Australia Day. Uh, you will. Will you be? Uh, we need a New Zealand Day. Like I'm, I'm, I'm all for a patriotic New Zealand Day. I think we need to make one. I think we need to find a date that you know, like that suits. And because right now we have Waitangi Day, and I think that's garbage, right? So I think I'm uh, all for New uh, Zealand are you Day. Are to explain to our listeners what that is? Oh, so Waitangi Day is the day in which the um, the Treaty of Waitangi, which was the treaty between the the, uh, the English settlers and the Maori tribes um, or certain Maori tribes of New Zealand, uh, uh, was signed, and that's sort of what Waitangi Day is, and that's sort of like our national day. But I think I think the whole thing is ridiculous. I think we need to scrap the whole thing and start again and have a New Zealand Day, right? Um, but that's my, my thoughts on it. I think the whole thing is ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds like the opposite of Australia Day. That's what the left... Uh, sounds like the left's dream holiday. It is, it is, and it's mental. It is mental. Uh, well, we'll celebrate Australia Day in solidarity with us. Oh, man, I would love to. I think we should, we should have an Anzac Day. Oh, we do have Anzac Day. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Australia and New Zealand Army Corps. We're, we yeah, get yeah, to share yeah. that day together. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I'm very much in favour of a New Zealand Patriotic Day, that's for sure. Well, that's all we've got time for today. So thank you, Daniel, for being my co-host today. Well, thank you. It was uh, great fun. I enjoyed it. So uh, a few important announcements before we finish. So voting closes soon for the 2016 Unshackled Awards. We'll announce the winners uh, on Australia Day. So we have uh, seven of our categories up on the website at the moment. Uh, there is the uh, uh, Regressive of the Year. There is the uh, Patriot of the Year, the Unshackler of the Year. There is the uh, Cis White Male of the Year, the Triggered Feminist of the Year, the Cuck of the Year, and there is also the Media Personality of the Year. We've got three more categories to go, so make sure that you go onto the Unshackled website and cast your vote. Uh, now, the other announcement I have is that uh, I would like to encourage all of our listeners uh, to sign up to our email list, which you can find at theunshackled.net slash subscribe. Now, most of our audience uh, became aware of us through Facebook. However, uh, as you all probably know, Facebook doesn't really like right-wing voices. There have been numerous cases of users being banned for saying politically incorrect things and uh, right-wing pages being shut down. Now, this could happen to the Unshackled at any time, and it would mean we would no longer be able to connect with a lot of our audience. So we, so far, we've been blocked numerous times from sharing our articles, so uh, we've certainly not been immune to this censorship. So to make sure that uh, we can stay in touch and keep you informed of when new content is published on the Unshackled, please sign up to the email list so we aren't at the mercy of the Facebook censors. Our newsletter at the moment is uh, uh, once a week, but hopefully uh, when we continue to expand, we can send it more often. So I'll leave a link to uh, the uh, 
the sign up form in the description. Uh, don't forget, uh, you can always support The Unshackled. You can either become a patron on Patreon, donate via PayPal, or sign up to be an advertiser uh, on the show. Uh, and also don't forget to check out the unshackled.net for all the latest news. And of course, don't forget to uh, subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, uh, SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, and view the video version on YouTube. So thanks once again for listening and I'll see you next time. Thank you, mate.